So, tonight I was going to talk about a subject, you're the guinea pigs I'm afraid, because it's a subject most people consider quite boring, <laughs> on, uh, but it's a beautiful subject on virtue. Now that's probably got a bad rap, maybe in the West, maybe all over the world, and I think sometimes in meditation circles it's not discussed as much as it might be. So often we're very, very eager to start understanding our body, our mind, what's happening. Often we're drawn to meditation for stress relief, first of all, because we live such busy, stressful lives. And very rarely is sila, what we call sila in the Pali language. You can translate that as virtue or ethics, even morality. Very rarely is this really discussed and put in the context of the practice. So there's another word in the commentaries which uh, goes along with sila. I've not read that myself, but samadhana, which means harmony or coordination, which is also very nice because it sort of implies that um, effect that our virtue can have in community. But it also, to me, implies a sense of integrity, like having a sense of harmony within ourselves, with our body, speech and mind. So in Buddhism, sila, virtue, is not only about our actions of body and speech, but perhaps even more importantly, it's about our mental conduct, yeah? The way we use our mind to create happiness or suffering for ourselves, yeah? So that means ways that we look at life, ways that we um, interpret or perceive ourselves, other people, situations. Are we looking in wise ways that actually generate the development of wholesome states? that lead to happiness, that beautify the mind, that elevate our heart? Or are we looking in ways that just create a fault-finding mind and make us miserable and grumpy and not very nice to be around? Yeah? <laughs> Quite often it's the latter, especially actually in England. <laughs> especially with the weather, I blame it all on the weather, but you can't really blame it on that. So, you know, in, in bad weather, you need to have an even bigger smile, I think. So anyway, um, this, the topic of virtue is very beautiful and, and the Buddha talks about this as the foundation for practice. So it, it kind of goes hand in hand with mindfulness, with wisdom, with stillness. You know, sometimes we have to have a bit of wisdom to see how we can improve our conduct, right? We have to have some insight into how we're harming or hurting others to have the motivation to come out of that behavior and to, you know, refine ourselves a little bit. So it's a little bit of a question of which comes first. And I really love this aspect that Sila is something that is not a given. It's not a rule or a commandment, but it's something that can be trained. It's something that can be developed and refined in time yeah, through the practice. And that's how I came to it, actually, because I started with meditation and I went on in one of the very strict Goenka courses where you basically can't do anything immoral for those 10 days. You can't even speak to somebody. I remember on the last day going, she used to say, well, you've had perfect sila for the whole 10 days, but tomorrow there's a slight risk because tomorrow you'll be talking to each other. Slight risk is there, he used to say. And of course it was more difficult to observe, um, you know, purity of speech than probably purity of most of the other ethical conducts. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. But in a nutshell, the Buddha said that um, the teaching of the Buddhas is to refrain from doing harm, refrain from evil or bad action, and to do good actions to purify the mind. Yeah? This is the teaching of all the Buddhas. So to abstain from actions that harm or hurt ourselves or others, but on the positive side to actually perform actions which promote the welfare and happiness of others, yeah? which lead to their protection, protect them from harm and danger. So sila is not only something around abstaining, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. It can also be very, very creative and really good fun. As Aya Suchita was saying just in the tea time now, it was very beautiful because really what she was talking about was ways of looking at life that generate these wholesome qualities and generate happiness for those around us. You know, quite rightly she was saying if you've got, if you've made certain decisions in your life, you know, you either, if you're not happy in those, then either make a change or just decide to enjoy it. Decide to see the good, you know. You had children, so now enjoy giving them love. Enjoy taking them to school every day, making them food every day. They all eat something <laughs> different, but you know, never mind, blend it up, they won't notice. So really enjoy it and put all your love into it, you know. And this is the way we meditate too. Yeah? 
We have to really give all our love to every moment because this is the only one we have. In a way, this moment is our child, you know. Each breath is like born from our chest. We have to give it love, we have to give it care. So this whole movement of compassion and care runs throughout the teachings and it starts with our conduct. In a way, that's an expression of what we've understood on the cushion. And it can be quite upsetting for me personally sometimes. I get a bit, I don't know, you could call it judgmental or just a bit, um, uh, what's the word? I suppose surprised and, and confused that a person can be a very good meditator, but that doesn't necessarily translate into taking care and being selfless and thinking about others once they get up off the seat. You know, you can easily slip back into your old habits and patterns. And that's the challenge, I think. It can cause a lot of damage and harm to people's faith when that happens. Even in the retreat I just sat, um, you know, we were all meditating for a month at Forest Refuge in Massachusetts. And it was lovely. We had great teachers. We had beautiful, crisp, white snow in the forest. It came down like powder and then it turned crisp. And I was like, wow, in England, it just goes to this mushy, mushy mucky slosh within about a day. But here everything was white and sparkly and, and really beautiful. So the setting was lovely and everybody was practicing diligently. And then one day it was a tiny little thing, but I just saw that in the, <laughs> it sounds very petty, but I saw that in the library book, in the library um, sign out book, we were supposed to have books for two weeks, but somebody had signed out the book for two weeks and then without bringing it back, signed it out again. But they changed the handwriting <laughs> so that it looked like two different people. And I knew this person, so I knew the writing. And it was either even written like with the initials differently and the full name differently. So everything changed. And I just felt, because you're very sensitive in retreat, and I felt there was a sense of deceit in that. And I, I immediately, I'm not usually a, very, a particularly demonstrably angry person, but, um, but I got this room, <laughs> like you did the other, room. <laughs> She's very good at miming. I'm not so good, but it kind of came through me like this sort of, ah, oh, that, that really sucks because I wanted to believe that this person was practicing sincerely. And of course they were, you know, it's just that we're not perfect, right? Um, but then I kind of contacted that feeling in my body and, and, and something underneath the anger. And I just realized it was a sense of disappointment and sadness which is already a lot softer than that kind of eh, people shouldn't do this. I wanted that book, actually. I wanted that book. <laughs> so uh, and then I contacted that feeling. And from there, I sensed compassion. I sensed a, um, compassion arise, first of all, towards my own sadness and disappointment, but then also to this person, because perhaps they didn't realize that they were harming others. I'm sure they didn't. Maybe the book was really helping them, you know, with their practice. Perhaps that's why they'd inspired me with their you know, demeanor and their sense restraint. You know, perhaps that was the gift they were giving. They weren't perfect in every as attribute, aspect. So, you know, it's just learning to contact our feelings and, and respond in a different way. And that's why I always like to start this meditation by bringing that presence of mind to our experience. And the body's a really convenient place to start, right? Because we can't deny we have this physical lump but also imbuing that awareness with a sense of kindness, yeah? As though mindfulness were a medium through which your compassion can actually flow onto certain areas and onto your whole experience, yeah? So the Buddha talks about compassion as the best motivation, really, to starting the practice, and particularly in um, the Majjhima Nikaya, in uh, the Kandaraka Sutta, which is Majjhima Nikaya 51, for anyone who wishes, I'll do a little... <laughs> That's the flog of the evening, okay, until the Dana talk. <laughs> so this is the book. And it's very lovely because in here there were four kinds of people practicing. And the Buddha asked um, somebody called Pesa, who I think was an elephant trainer. It's all set in ancient India. So it's one way that you can actually s tell that these suttas are quite authentic because sometimes he talks about the geography and the place that he was in and that changes, you know, over time. So he talks to this person and he says, um, I think it was Pesa, what kind of person pleases your mind? One kind of person tortures and torments themselves and others. Another kind tortures and torments themselves, but not others. The next one tortures and torments others, but not themselves. And the last one, of course, tortures and torments neither. And of course, what would the answer be? Neither, right? And, and the nice bit was that he said, 
Um, the last kind of person delights my mind because all beings um, recoil from pain and desire happiness. And I just think that's such a beautiful reason for practicing virtue. You know, all beings desire happiness and recoil from pain. That's basically what we're looking for, isn't it? Unconditional happiness, which doesn't depend on everything going just to plan or even that other people will treat us kindly or sign the books back in. You know, <laughs> it's a kind of happiness that's above and beyond that. And we're all, we're all looking for it in our own ways. Most of them are deluded ways because we don't quite yet know where our happiness lies. But we're starting to learn, you know, we're starting to learn about ourselves and what leads to happiness, what leads to suffering. And I think it's interesting because we all think we know that we shouldn't hurt or harm ourselves or others. But most of the, a lot of the time, I can speak from my own experience, we're very good at not hurting and harming others, at least superficially. But we don't mind staying on the computer for hours and hours into the late night, you know, really tiring out our poor old brains and, and, and harming ourselves. And this was what the Buddha did call one of the extremes. You know, he said any kind of practice that, I mean, it's often translated as mortification, but it actually means any kind of practice that fatigues the body and the mind is to be avoided because it's not the way to happiness. Yeah? Equally, any kind of indulgence in the senses, indulgence in good food, in physical touch, in even beautiful sights, sounds, smells, it's not necessarily unwholesome, but indulgence in that is not going to lead you to complete happiness. Yeah, you're still very much dependent and that's one of the problems. You know, the more we do it, sometimes the more we need to, right? You went on one cruise last year around, I don't know, the Channel Isles, but this year you have to go to the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things stop having that same hit. But the Buddha said that sila gives you a very pure kind of happiness, practicing virtue. And it's what he called a blameless bliss. Yeah, it's the bliss of non-regret, non-remorse. And it's something that we don't really notice, which is why I wanted to start the meditation just by reflecting on anything that you've done that you may think of as a kind action. If you don't want to do that, think of something someone else did that felt kind or generous or, you know, they didn't really need to do it. Because there's a certain happiness in that. And even in the fact that you haven't harmed somebody, you know, that gives you a sense of self-respect and confidence. Yeah. One way you can tell that an action is virtuous is because it's motivated by compassion, by loving kindness, by non-greed, non-ill will, by a sense of harmlessness, non-violence. Yeah? If you're coming from that kind of place, then that's a very good uh, measure that your speech, your bodily actions, even your mental actions will be helpful will be conducive to the good and, and benefit of others, not harming others. Yeah? So there's a way we can tell. And I think for me, when I started to practice in meditation, it was really fascinating to see that any time my mind moved towards something negative or the thought of maybe not harming another, but even just going to a party or listening to music or dreaming about the cake that was in Kathmandu for sure, that they'd just cooked that morning and I was going to eat after the retreat. You know, any time that happened, it was usually because there was some kind of discontent inside. I was already suffering before I needed to think about substituting that suffering for sensual pleasure. Yeah. There was a very interesting experiment. I think it was a talk I saw on uh, TEDx or something. And um, they had a video and an actress behind, uh, I think it was a cafe. They had this actress um, at the till. And she'd been told to give people the wrong change, <laughs> like a lot of wrong change. So people were coming with, say, a five or ten dollar note. It was in America and they were buying cake or coffee or whatever it was. And she was giving them the change for a fifty dollar note. And they had the camera on this to see what people would do. And you, like me, may think that a lot of people pocketed the change and didn't say anything. But actually, everybody to a certain point did that. They, they gave the change back. Sorry, yeah, they didn't pocket it, they gave the change back. They said, uh, I'm sorry, but I think you've given me too much here. And afterwards, the um, person doing the, the experiment asked them why. And they said, well, you know, she's maybe got kids, she's got a family to feed. We didn't, you know, that might have come out of her own purse and we didn't want her to be in trouble or even lose her job. So we just gave it back because it's the right thing to do. And we didn't feel right about that. But then somewhere along the way in this experiment, um, it changed. 
And it was the same actress, but she started to be a little bit less attentive and happy and smiley and pleasant with the customers. So in the first um, instance, she was on her mobile phone and the customer was standing there and just kind of waiting. And, and she was just, ah, blah, 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 sort of, you know, completely ignoring the, the guy who was waiting for his coffee and cake. And we all want coffee and cake, quick. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so he was getting a bit agitated. And, um, and then when she did talk to him, she was quite rude. And, and I think she gave him the wrong order or something like this, what he didn't ask for. And very interestingly, when he finally got what he'd asked for and he got all the wrong change, like about $45, it showed him on the camera sort of looking around and then okay I'm just gonna walk away with that <laughs> and I thought that was really interesting and afterwards I related that to my own experience in meditation of when you know I noticed some sort of uh, discontent or maybe reaction aversion pushing away an unpleasant sensation at those times I'm much more likely to start to speak in a maybe not very beneficial way to people or start complaining, you know, maybe not stealing, but, you know, this is where it starts from, this sense of uh, greed, hatred and delusion in the mind. Yeah, we're not happy. And so we go out looking in the wrong places for our happiness. So that was quite interesting. And I did actually want to get to the precepts at some point, but I'm waffling. Um, <laughs> but I just want to read out a little bit about um, some of these particular uh, virtuous acts, because there's a lovely place in the suttas here, which talks about not only the negatives of what we shouldn't be doing, but also the positive correlation. So for example, the first one says, um, this is for the bhikkhus and the bhikkhunis, so this is for people who've gone forth, but this applies to anybody actually. It's just part of the gradual training that the Buddha talks about in this particular sutta. So after this pesa says that, you know, all beings desire happiness and recoil from pain, the next stage for him was to develop confidence in the Dhamma. He heard the teachings and he developed some confidence because this was a way in which he could actually apply his understanding of compassion you know, and, and start to care about his conduct in reality. So the Buddha was giving him teachings as to how to do this. So he went forth and shaved off his hair and it says, took the yellow robes. So you can see we're doing the same thing. And then it says, having gone forth and possessing the bhikkhu or the bhikkhuni's training and way of life, one abandons the killing of living beings, abstains from the killing of living beings. Yeah, so we all know that this is wrong. And usually the Buddha talks about this one first because it's the, it's the grossest form of, of misconduct, yeah, if you like. It's the biggest breakage of sila to actually intentionally take life. And you also have more potential with living beings to make good karma by caring and protecting them. Yeah. And then it says the opposite. It says, with rod and weapon laid aside, conscientious, merciful, one abides compassionate to all living beings. So this is so beautiful and there's so much scope there to really take care of people, yeah? Not just to refrain from doing something that would hurt them, but actually to do positive things. And they don't have to be big things. I think Mother Teresa said, we're not asked to do great things. We're just asked to do small things with great love. And I think that's so beautiful, yeah? And the whole purpose really of the monastic life is to live a life of harmlessness. The Buddha said, you know, a renunciant, a samana, is known by one who is harmless and one who causes harm is not a samana, is not a true renunciant. Yeah. So one of the beautiful gifts that we give to others by, you know, developing compassion is the gift of safety. People feel they can trust us. You know, often people might look at us a bit strange as monastics. They may think, oh, I'm not sure why they're dressed like that, why they're wearing those kind of robes, you know. Did something go wrong in their life? <laughs> my mum for a long time used to, I could see her moving towards me and wanting to stroke my beautiful hair, but it wasn't there, you know. And she was like, oh, and I said, oh, you oh. <laughs> and it was really a bit, yeah, a bit heartbreaking. But, you know, even if people respect us or not, and sometimes they do, you know, sometimes there's a lot of respect and, and appreciation for, for what we do as monastics. Very rarely are people afraid. 
And I always feel really grateful for the history, really, of all those who've gone before us, you know, for the good practicing Buddhists and the monks and nuns, for having kept this alive, because very rarely will people respond with fear. And what a gift that is to be able to give fearlessness to others, even to animals. Yeah? Even animals are not afraid around us because we're trained to really take care of the smallest creature. You know, it can be very tempting to just squish a mosquito or an ant. But I've lived with ants in India, actually. I had a huge amount of ants in um, Gujarat in my little squat toilet once and in the whole shower because the whole shower was a wet area. And there was no way sometimes that I could have a shower without wetting these ants. So sometimes I've just had to leave the water afterwards and I figured out actually how long they could swim for. <laughs> so I could have my shower and then kind of remove them from the water before they'd be okay. They could swim for ages because they were really big. But they became my friends. And I remember telling one of the Dhamma servers at the end that um, there were these ants in the toilet and they'd become my friends. And she sort of said, oh, oh, we'll better go and clean it. I'm really sorry. And I said, please don't, you know, because they're part of the bathroom now. I really like them. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, it's helpful to anthrop anthropomorphize little creatures as well. And just to see that they too want to protect their life and they also recoil from pain and danger and any threat to that. Yeah. If you see birds, people always think birds are very cute, but just have a really good look. They're absolutely terrified, you know, they're always looking around them before they take anything. Their little heads move so fast, you know, always on the lookout for something that's going to eat them up. I had this really sad experience actually in Burma with a spider because there was a huge spider on my wall and I really like spiders but it was about that big and it was on my wall for a while and then one day um, no, maybe it wasn't quite that big but its body was sort of that big and one day it had a white bit here and it just looked really freaky and I remember thinking no I think it's been on the wall long enough because uh, it just looked strange so I got a broom and um, sort of knocked it down to the floor and then I saw the white part come away from the spider and the spider run. And then I realized the white part was an egg. And that spider was in the corner of my room for a whole week grieving over this egg. And I realized, you know, I tried to put the egg back and, you know, not to touch it, but it basically rejected it after that. And for a whole week, it was in the corner, just hunched up. And I thought, ah, either it's dead or it's grieving, but it was grieving, you know, and after a week it came out again. And since then, I've never touched these things when they're on my wall because they know where to go and they know how to avoid you. You know, so we can really take care of these small things and not think they're too insignificant to bother about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, Suchinta, sorry to keep mentioning you, but she told a very nice story earlier on about um, the kangaroos in Australia because the monasteries there are huge and we've got lots of bush and uh, there's all these kangaroos that come there probably because it's a bit greener than other parts of the bush. And uh, they're so unafraid of people. They just, you can walk right past them, even when they have their little joeys and the joeys come out. They get a bit more protective, but they still go very, very close to people. But Ayasa Chinta, as you've seen, is a very gentle and, and harmless being. And I think she's <laughs> cultivated a lot of metta. And she said the kangaroos actually used to follow her. <laughs> and isn't that just so lovely? They never did that to me. They didn't follow me except when I had a bowl of food, then they would be like... <laughs> <laughs> looking in my bowl but uh, but I just think that's so lovely because they feel really trusting and really safe so that's what we offer to all beings by cultivating loving kindness in our hearts yeah and then the next one is about uh, I've gone on to my time the next one is about um, abandoning the taking of what is not given and here it doesn't say a lot more than that other than not ex oh sorry expecting only what is not given only what is given so not only do we not take what's not given we don't even expect to get more than we actually receive yeah and this is very great training as a monastic because if we expect there to be a big chocolate cake at lunchtime there isn't going to be one <laughs> and that's a lot of suffering but if we don't expect anything then whatever's there looks just wonderful and delightful and it's been made with love. So the opposite of this taking is of course giving. And Bhikkhu Bodhi describes this really beautifully. He said it's the seed and foundation, giving generosity is the seed and foundation of the Buddhist practice and of all spiritual practice. And one of the reasons is because it connects us to the whole movement of the path. 
The whole movement is a movement of giving, giving, letting go, giving away, giving up. Yeah? And again, in meditation, this is what we attempt to do. We're not sitting down to get something, to attain things, to say, hey, you know, I got this flashing light in front of me and I saw scenes of the nature and, you know, I'm so peaceful now and you really should try it. That usually doesn't work as a way to convince people to meditate. But what people do get attracted to and is, you know, the beauty that we cultivate in our heart and how giving we become and how selfless. So this generosity is something we can do in the practice too. We can really give our full attention in every moment. Yeah, we can give our heart to the breath. <laughs> we can really befriend it, you know, rather than say, hey, come over here, breath, and stay with me. It's like, if you want to come, you can come, and if you don't, that's fine by me. And then the breath really likes you and it wants to stay. You know, so we give. Sometimes, you know, you feel like your mind's totally unsettled. But I like to think that I'm just giving my time anyway for the sake of the Buddha, because he taught, you know, because he gave us the Dhamma. So I'll just give an hour of my time or five minutes of my time to just meditate, you know, just to show up. Yeah, so we can give many things. We don't have to be rich. And as monastics, we don't have much to give. The Buddha did say that the highest giving is to be able to give the gift of Dhamma, yeah, to be able to help and inspire others on the path. But most of the time, we're not in a position to do that. We're just training ourselves. But we can give our energy, we can give our time, we can listen, you know, give wise counsel if that's what's needed. Or just make each other a cup of tea. You know, since I got here, Irina's been doing this. She's been noticing all the little places where I may have forgotten something or, you know, forgotten to get myself a drink or left my robe in the wrong room. And she's just there. She knows and she's like, can I give you, a, I've made you a pot of tea. And that's just so caring and so beautiful. It means so much more than any amount of donations would ever mean, you know, or a new robe or whatever it would be. So this giving is a very beautiful part of the path which immediately applies to practice. And then the one, uh, okay, I'll read this one as well, about uh, basically in the sutta here, it's talking about abandoning in celibacy and observing celibacy. But again, this is for the monastics. But what it really means for the lay people who maybe are not celibate and are in sexual relationships or committed partnerships is that we give each other the gift of trust. Yeah? So if we've made a commitment to somebody, we, we honour that commitment. Yeah? We don't cheat on people. We don't flirt with other people. You, know, you make your commitment and you make it work. Yeah? Of course, you can't be perfect, but you can always ask for forgiveness. And my teacher, Ajahn Brown, with a big heart, he always says, whenever anybody asks for forgiveness, please, please give it, no matter what they've done. You, know, you make it a safe place so that others will come forward with the truth. Because fear is what drives the truth underground. You know, when we're afraid, then we're, we can't be honest. We try to sort of you know, deceive and bend the truth, keep things hidden from each other. So by remaining committed to one person, it can be a wonderful spiritual practice. I can't really speak from experience, that's true, because I've been a nun for a long time and also celebrate for even longer. But it is a way that you can care for each other and learn to put your needs, maybe not after your partners, but think about the two of you rather than just yourself. Yeah? And this is a great way to start overcoming that sense of self. And then the other one, which is really tricky, of course, is right speech. So I'm going over only a little bit. <laughs> but I want to read this because it's just such a beautiful way to explain, explain what right speech is. I just love the way the Buddha phrases all of this. So it says here, abandoning false speech, one abstains from false speech. One speaks truth, adheres to truth, is trustworthy and reliable. One abstains from malicious speech. Oh, sorry. One who is no deceiver of the world. Yeah. Abandoning malicious speech. One abstains from malicious speech. Does not repeat elsewhere what he's heard here in order to divide those people from these. Nor does one repeat to these people what they've heard there in order to divide these people from those. <laughs> I think we're all familiar with the gossip, right? And the sort of, let's have a little bitch about somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Thus, one is one who reunites those who are divided. A promoter of friendship, 
who enjoys concord, rejoices in concord and delights in concord. A speaker of words that promote concord. Isn't that lovely? So again, that's about harmony, you know, this samadhana. And it's so important in any community to really develop a harmonious atmosphere for practice, a place where people feel respected, trusted, safe. They feel that their good qualities are seen and encouraged rather than all their faults pointed out all the time. Yeah. And so the Buddha even says when giving feedback, you know, we can give feedback to each other, but it should be gentle with a heart of metta at the right time and about what's beneficial. Yeah. And also it should be true, it should be correct. You should have your facts straight before you start to admonish anybody. So we speak directly to each other rather than backbite and you know, gossip about each other to others. Sometimes that's so tempting, especially if we don't know what to do about it or if we feel quite upset about something. But I think there's a big difference in speaking about another person just for the sake of offloading and speaking about somebody because you're genuinely concerned and you genuinely want to understand them better and learn how to approach them to give them some valuable feedback, not just feedback because it will make you feel better to give it. Yeah, sometimes it's too easy to say I'm giving it for their sake, but actually you're giving it because you're irritated. So it's so important again to check in with our motivation all the time. So then it says abandoning harsh speech, one abstains from harsh speech. Speak such words that are gentle, pleasing to the ear and lovable as go to the heart, a courteous, desired by many and agreeable to many. Yeah. Yeah, I think we've done the gossip one. So right speech is something where we have a great potential to, to create happiness for others. Yeah, we can always give a gift of speech and we're not always very good at that. Sometimes we can praise others, but others don't receive the praise too easily. And I've found that it's also equally important to learn how to receive praise because sometimes people want to give. They want to say, I see this quality in you. And if you say, oh, no, 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 that's like a rejection of their gift. So if we can learn to say yes, oh, thank you. I, I really appreciate you telling me that. That means a lot. That's much nicer. Then there's this energy flow where you feel you can give and receive and you can actually promote each other's goodness, right? Because you're not just doing it to feel good about yourself, although that's important, but you're doing that to be empowered, to be of benefit to others as well, yeah? So we have to learn how to cultivate the wholesome qualities and the sila begins by undermining the really um, strong hindrances to meditation, sensory desire, ill will, doubt, sleepiness, drowsiness and confusion. Yeah? I've missed one out. Restlessness, restlessness and remorse. Yeah? So one of the first benefits of living a life of virtue is that you don't have a lot of remorse. When you don't have a lot of remorse, what's there to be restless about? You know, you don't have to sit there and worry. You feel confident about what you're doing in your life, about the goodness of your heart. So when you sit down to meditate, the Buddha says, it's natural that you develop joy. You don't have to make a volition, may I develop joy in my meditation. He says, for one without remorse and regret, it's natural that joy arises. And equally, if joy is not arising in your meditation, you can ask yourself, you know, was there something up with my conduct today? You know, have I been a bit mean or stingy? Have I not done enough good service or enough giving? You know, maybe I should have gone to volunteer at Empty Cloud Monastery. <laughs> <laughs> but don't worry, there's always another opportunity coming soon. <laughs> yeah. So just have a look at your conduct. And, and the Buddha said there are things you can do. You can reflect upon your conduct. You can say, okay, I've done good today. You know, I've made myself a shelter from anguish, are the words in the suttas. I've done good, I've not done harm. You know, I'm living my life well. I'm on the right path, you know, and just bring that up. Because sometimes we assume that it's normal, but it's not normal. You could be doing anything else this evening, but you're here, you know, and that's a really wonderful thing. Yeah. So from joy, he says, you don't have to make any special effort. You don't even have to decide may piti arise. Piti is the kind of bliss or rapture, a very gentle and beautiful feeling that can arise in the meditation when your mind really starts to latch on to the object of meditation. So in meditation on the breath, for example, there's this sustained interest in the breath and you 
feel so happy just to stay with it and the mind and the body start to really settle and calm and feel very blissful and peaceful. It's a peaceful kind of happiness. Yeah? And from there the Buddha says you don't need to make any effort or any volition may my body and mind become tranquil because it's natural <coughs> that if you feel this kind of happiness the body just starts to calm and settle. Yeah? And quite often again you know, we can't really fully relax because there's something amiss in our life. We know, you know, maybe I am going to get a fine if I've taken the library book out for too long from a public library. <laughs> you know, or I forgot to feed the cat. So you can't settle quite as easily. You know? And then from tranquility we get a really deep inner happiness that's the proximate cause for deep stillness of the mind. Yeah? And even at this stage when there's a lot of happiness in the mind and you're almost getting really, really still, and really, really getting into your samadhi, your object of meditation, and the mind and the object of becoming one. Even at that stage, some people have this sense of, I don't deserve it coming up, you know? Or feeling like, yeah, guilty about something in the past. Or even just not fully being able to surrender to the object of meditation, because their heart doesn't feel like a good enough place to surrender to, yeah? So we can't underestimate the power of this sila to guide the practice, to strengthen it, and to create this beautiful foundation for meditation. You know, you can create a small foundation if you want to, just a few bricks or whatever, and start to build. And some people do that, you know, and that's okay for, if they want to. But you know, the building gets very, very high, very, very quickly sometimes, but it's not very stable and doesn't last long. It certainly doesn't withstand earthquakes, you know, of the hindrances. <laughs> But if you build a huge, strong foundation, which is very broad and wide, and then you build a building which is more like a pyramid, yeah? So you make the successive bricks also very, very strong, you know, the sense restraint, how we use our mind, yeah? The confidence in the Buddha's teachings, yeah? All the foundations for practice, strong. Then it takes a lot longer, but it's a lot wider, stronger. It can have the potential to go higher and it will withstand all those earthquakes, you know, especially the temptations of, you know, sense, the sensory desire, yeah, and the fires of ill will. And slowly as our minds become purified in this way, we're able to see where the real source of suffering lies, in the delusion, you know, that we take a, the to be a self when there is no self, or we take things to be permanent when they're actually impermanent. And we take things that are actually causing us suffering to be happiness. Yeah. So our whole understanding of where happiness comes from and how to get it changes. Yeah. And the happiness is no longer limited to ourself, but spreads to all beings. The Buddha taught out of compassion for the good and benefit of all beings. He didn't keep it in. You know, he spent the rest of his life after enlightenment just trying to help others to come to the same practice and to realise what he realised. <coughs> so each of us have a chance to do that. So keep on cultivating the sila. Yeah? Any little action helps. And don't worry about the mistakes because this is a training. You know, it's much better to just forgive yourself and move on than to you know, be filled with remorse. Just learn, that didn't work. Let me see why, what happened, what was the cause. Yeah, and make changes. So this is my uh, slightly longer than expected offering for the evening, but we'll still have a little bit of time for question and answers if you want to. So thank you very much. <laughs> that's a very interesting thing for me for most monastics they have very beautiful stories and you said something about India too and I'm trained under Ajahn Brahm and I know Ajahn Brahm was not an Indian correct so could you go through some of the other traditions or I'm even older than Ajahn Brahm no I'm not <laughs> 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 yes um, so yes, I could try and make the long story short. Yes. Um, so in my teens, <laughs> I had a very um, 
unhappy awakening to the fact that I didn't have much meaning in my life and I needed to find one. And I felt that I wouldn't find it in England around familiar things in a capitalistic society where I was just told to go to school, get good grades, go to uni, get better grades and then get a professional job. And I just panicked really at the thought of that. And um, I had a very good and very close best friend who's now one of my trustees in my project back home. Uh, and we had the crazy idea to go to Asia. We heard that there were full moon parties in Thailand. <laughs> That's the honest truth. But she said, well, India's near to Thailand, so why don't we go to Thailand and then go to India? And I said, well, okay, why not? You know, because we just wanted to get away and to get a change, to have a change. So I went to India and um, I knew I was there to look for something, but I really didn't know what it was. I just knew I needed to be somewhere different and find a different, um, way of approaching life, perhaps, a different um, sense of meaning, more purpose, more meaning in my life. And as soon as I got to India, I noticed there, were, there was something different. First of all, like the truths of life, of suffering, of impermanence, especially death, birth and death, were very, very evident and they weren't hidden away. But there was also this, even though there was a lot of poverty, there was this sense of aliveness in people's eyes that really intrigued me, as though they knew there was something beyond themselves. Mm -hmm. Because I think people in the West get very, very caught up with themselves and their small problems in day-to-day -day life. And here it just felt that there was a much greater sense of being connected to everyone else and a sense that there was, they were there for a purpose. I didn't really understand what it was or understand much about it, but slowly over my travels, I heard about these retreats where you can go for 10 days and just be in complete silence on your own and look at your body, look at your mind. And because in my teens I've been quite depressed, I, I already knew that if you weren't happy, nothing outside could make a difference. Mm -hmm. So I had a sense that happiness must be coming from inside. And I wanted to understand the way my mind worked. So I just wanted to go on these retreats to see what would happen, basically. So I don't know whether that's a spiritual interest or a psychological interest. I just wanted an end of suffering. I don't know why, but for some reason I really suffered and I felt that it was more than only my own suffering. It felt like the suffering of the world somehow. So I went on this retreat and everything I heard was just putting my own thoughts and feelings that were unformed into words. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't believe it. I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just on a high. I mean, even though it was physical agony, uh, <laughs> you know, and, but I was 20, I was really up for that. I didn't really mind. It was like part of the adventure, but I just knew I'd come across something really important. And especially when he talked about suffering and the end of suffering and also um, dependent origination, mm -hmm. how suffering arises. I just thought this is amazing. I found my path and this is all I want to do. Mm -hmm. So I spent the next 10 years in Asia, mostly in India, sitting and serving countless courses. It was basically all I did. And I'd just go to different countries to try and earn a bit of money to come back and carry on. So I did that, but the whole time I was looking for a place to ordain and it took 10 years to find something. That's how it is for women quite often. I think as a monk, I'd have had more chance. As a man, I'd have had more chance. But after 10 years, I did hear about a teacher in Burma who was um, teaching in the same tradition, but it was also quite realized. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know the impact that would have, but it had a huge impact to meet somebody who'd really experienced the depth of the Dhamma was just so moving and so um, deepening of faith that I determined to spend the rest of my life there. Mm -hmm. But I got sick. <laughs> I got really sick. I mean, I don't mind a bit of sickness and I'm not sort of, you know, we were sitting for like hours at a stretch and I'm not sort of uh, giving up easily on things, but it was just unsurmountable. And luckily it coincided with the time that I first heard Ajahn Brahm's teachings that he gives to the monastics, which were actually very deep and powerful. But they also had the aspect of um, understanding Western psychology and a lot of kindness and metta. And I guess I'd come to the point in my practice where I realized I needed that. I needed a lot more gentleness and softness and kindness. And they just spoke to my heart. It was some kind of comic connection because I knew he's my teacher. Even though I didn't know who he was, where he lived or anything, I decided to go and find him 
<laughs> so I wrote a couple of letters which were ignored, but it didn't bother me. I still went and uh, I did actually meet him a few months later. So that's 10 years ago. Yeah. Ajahn Brahm, yeah, I left Burma and I met him in Germany first time, yeah. And he knew I was there to meet him as a teacher and I feel even from then he was sort of taking me under his wing, not quite, but by the second time we met, yeah. he said, come to Perth and we'll take it from there. So yeah. I knew I was, when was that? there. Uh, I, 2011 and I went to Perth in 2012. Right. And since then we've been, yeah, but, yeah, been quite closely connected, so. Very fortunate. So, so you were in India, you were in Gujarat as well? I was also in Gujarat, yeah, in Dhamma Sindhu. I was in Bada, Kutch. But, but I was all over India. I was in Nasi, I was in the Himalayas. I was yeah. all over. So yeah. You were working for the Vipassana uh, yeah. organization? Yeah, yeah, serving, yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. I just want to um, see if anyone else wants to ask anything. Yes. <coughs> so, th this chat was about virtue? Yes. somebody who wholeheartedly believes that they also are acting out of virtue but mm. it's in complete conflict with what your mission is right so do you mean like how you get along with them or how you continue to work together or how you change them Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't <know>. Centipede. Centipede. <laughs> oh, he's just he's just giving us the training in action. <laughs> we talked about this. How big is he? Where is he? Can't even see. Him. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's the excitement of the evening. <laughs> yes. Shall we? Shall we go back to your question? So yeah, could you just um, clarify it a little bit for me? I, yeah, I guess um, you know when 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 I feel like I'm doing or trying to educate other people on mm. something. Do the right thing. Reveal the truth. Yeah. yeah. And it winds up being yeah. completely in conflict. Hmm. That's tricky. I mean, it's really hard to um, answer that unless, I, yeah, without knowing the precise relationship. But um, mm. I think it doesn't help to keep on trying to work out the conflict because the thing is, your truth is your truth and theirs is theirs. And in a way, you can only live your own truth. You have to really check in with your motivation and do what feels <coughs> right to you. Anything else will just be a lack of integrity and you won't feel good about yourself. So I think, I mean, if you are hoping they'll, you know, maybe if there's something in their behavior that really does look immoral to you, the best way is probably to lead by example, just to set a good example. But if it's a situation where you have to work with them or even live with them, say in a partnership, I actually think it's really important to have similar ethics, similar approaches. I mean, before I ordained, I actually had a partner who was practicing and we used to do long courses together, like month long courses and serve a lot. And, and um, I thought we were totally on the same path. But then there was one little thing that happened, which I thought was something I should mention to a teacher because it wasn't entirely in line with the precepts and he didn't think it was a problem. And um, straight away I knew hmm, there's something amiss because I've been tormented about this and he's just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so it didn't actually work in the long run. I think um, for long-term relationships, they say that um, two of the things that are most irreconcilable are very different personalities and different ethical values. Because we are all going to manifest that slightly differently. But I think the guideline in general, or one guideline that you can use to check out whether something really is virtuous or not, there are two ways. 
One is, does it cause harm to myself or others? Yeah, and it shouldn't cause harm to either. And what is the motivation? Is it motivated by greed, hate and delusion? Or is it motivated by kindness, compassion, letting go, generosity? And that you have to know for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Anyone? Yes. Well, I have one question, because uh, again, I said this last week, I'm a little ignorant on the, on the subject of Buddhism. Is there different, because we all know in Judaism there is like Hasidics and Orthodox Jews and Reform Jews. Is it, are there different, I guess, le- I don't know if it's levels or different followings, or what is the correct like terminology? I okay. I guess we'd say different lineages, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, you could say different sects. It depends. I mean, a sect to me implies that it's gone away from a lineage a little bit further, perhaps. I don't know. But yeah, there are. I mean, we follow, what, I think all of us four and maybe five um, are ordained into the Theravada tradition. But the Theravada tradition, I mean, they're sort of artificial, um, what do you call, separations in a sense. I prefer to call it early Buddhism because I'm trying to go back to the earliest texts and to the Buddha's words. But even the way that I read these teachings will be influenced by the way my teachers have talked about them and the way that I personally understand and live them. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think in general, people who do practice a sutta-based, you know, referring to these texts as sutta-based practice, will have a similar understanding of the Dhamma. Yeah, but even there, there's a lot of debate and discussion. So um, because the Buddha's path isn't so much a religion or a faith-based teaching, I think there is, by nature, a lot of um, scope for investigation and exploration and probably differences of opinion because we don't really have to say this is the way it is. We're encouraged to always keep looking. Mm -hmm. So I guess part of the reason why they're so different is because people are still looking. I mean, one of the things that I've found, because I don't know much about the other traditions, but one of the things that helps me understand is that everybody's speaking from their particular stage on the path. So somebody that's saying, giving their definition of um, enlightenment. Um, If it differs from my definition of enlightenment, it may be because they're calling a different stage enlightenment to what I'm calling enlightenment. So sometimes it's not that it's different, it's just that we're talking about different points on the path. So you could see it as like a mountain which you're climbing and somebody's got to here and from here they've understood this much, so a doctrine starts. Someone else climbs a bit higher, they've understood that, but they've also understood this. So then another doctrine starts from there. The Buddha climbs right to the top. So you can see all the different doctrines from above, but he gets the whole perspective. So then his teaching will be slightly different. So, yeah. Yeah, there are. One thing is in different uh, uh, lineage, the core teachings are the same, that doesn't change. Um, I can't say yes, definitive. I can't be def- I don't know def- definitely about that. I d- really don't know about that. I think they're very, very similar up to very high levels. And beyond that, I, I honestly don't know. I think um, to say yes or no would be a little bit presumptuous because I think it's hard to know. I mean, Bante has a lot more knowledge on this. If you come another time and talk to him about it, he might be able to say a yes or a no. Um, I just know that I trust in these teachings and that they, the teachings that I've practiced so far align with the Buddha's teaching and that the teachers who I have full confidence in as being realized beings have an understanding which aligns with the Buddha's teaching. And it, help, and it has helped them come out of suffering. I can see that they don't suffer and it's helping me. So that gives me a lot of confidence. So I just say try something if you feel inclined towards it. Sometimes it could be like past life inclinations. Maybe you've practiced a certain way before and that just resonates. It just speaks to you in ways that others don't, you know? So I think it's important to um, find the teachings and perhaps teachers who you resonate with and who you have a lot of confidence in (coughs) and check them out to see if their sealer is up to scratch. (laughs) Always check them out. Because that's a good uh, indication of whether they've really um, developed wisdom. One more? Yes. 
One last question, if anyone has. Two. Okay, we'll go with uh, the gentleman first. So, talking about kindness and compassion, yes. how would you react if you're showing the kindness, but um, you're not getting any reaction back, mm. and you feel a sort of disappointment, mm. or maybe sadness, mm. the reaction isn't what you expected? Mm -hmm. I mean, Clearly that indicates some amount of hope that you will have some sort of um, um, beneficial effect from that compassion. And we can't always um, rely on the other person to show us that. But I would say look inside and see if it's having an effect on you, because that's also important. Is that kindness and compassion having a beneficial effect on your own heart or not? And uh, I mean, it's natural that there's a little bit of expectation that it helps sure. another mm -hmm. as well and that they may start to appreciate it or change or soften, maybe come out of some difficulty. But um, yeah, we, unconditional love learns to let go of any expectation of, of reciprocity or, or um, effect. We actually practice these uh, Brahma Viharas, as the Buddha described, mm -hmm. to change our own hearts, not to change others. But I also think that it may appear that they're not responding or being affected, but I actually really, really believe in the power of compassion and love to affect change. And it may just be that that person's, you know, really struggling, maybe they've been traumatized, maybe it takes them a very long time to trust somebody. So I would say just be consistent and keep showing that you're a safe person, you're a safe space, you know, and that you have goodwill and good intent. Maybe try a little less hard. <laughs> <laughs> so that you don't feel tired or you know uh, disappointed when there's nothing coming back but one nice story that Ajahn Brahm tells is about um, this really grumpy more than grumpy I think quite tyrannical prison guard in Australia um, who was just really mean to all the prisoners and the prisoners heard some teachings from Ajahn Brahm and he said you know just try and keep on winning him over with kindness you know just do something kind for him, win him, turn him around, you know, make him cups of tea, whatever it is, say hello, smile. And so they were doing this for months and months and months. And this prison guard was just as bad as ever. He'd ignore them. He wouldn't even want the tea. Sometimes he'd push it away. He'd never smile. You know, he'd continue to shout and torment them. But then one day the prison guard went, uh, the prisoner went in and uh, he gave him the cup of tea and the prison guard went, Mm. <laughs> that was it and that was a response and this prisoner went to tell Ajahn Brahm at the end of the day and uh, he said to Ajahn Brahm this is what happened he went mm. and my teacher said great that's the start that's fantastic <laughs> and apparently from the mm, it didn't take that much longer to get him actually softening a little bit and starting to treat them a little more kindly so don't give up but yeah maybe relax the effort a bit and, and also remember yourself right give yourself some compassion too because it's easy to put all our attention on trying to be kind to others and we forget about ourselves uh one more and then I we'll i just wanted to thank you ah. for this wonderful thing this evening for oh. your wisdom thank you I accept that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You're all very well timed. It's amazing. Gosh, nine o'clock. Beautiful. Thank you.